uh, to you and welcome from the Institute of Sacred Music, Oxford at St. Stephen's House in Oxford in the United Kingdom. And welcome to this uh, continuing seminar series in Christian worship, music and human community. This evening's speaker is Dr. Peter Littman, who is coming to us from the Isle of Man. Uh, he is research fellow at St. Augustine School of Theology in Kent, organist and director of music at the Cathedral on the Isle of Man. Uh, he is an associate of the Royal School of Church Music and uh, an honorary fellow of the University College Isle of Man. It's very good to welcome Peter here um, to speak on music and the mystery. Uh, there'll be uh, opportunity for uh, conversation and questions at the end of the paper. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Peter. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you to the Institute for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, some of what I'm going to talk about is quite dense. So I think rather than take notes, you're welcome to take notes, but I will so I'll, I'll send Matthew the slides uh, and that has an awful lot of information on it. So uh, music and the mystery, to set the context, I've taken a uh, passage. Ooh, let me just go here. Oh, sorry. It's moved on too quick. doing apologies doesn't seem to be quite working the way that i'm going to i'm going to stop the share and sh reshare the screen if i may and that will hopefully sort out the problem no it hasn't ah here we go so i'll start with uh, a quote from uh, St. Augustine's Confessions. So I waver between the danger that lies in gratifying the sense and beliefs which, as I know, can one can accrue from singing. Yet when I find singing itself far more moving than the truth which it conveys, I confess this as a grievous sin. And at those times, I would prefer not to hear the singer. So music, as we know, can be both diverse and unifying. And Stephen Burns, in his 2018 book, Liturgy, suggests that in some traditions, music is used mainly as an accompaniment to the liturgical action by, by the, or the means by which a, a liturgical structure flows from one point to another. Whereas in other traditions, music and song have perhaps a more expansive role than this, and are sometimes seen at the very heart and style of the worship itself. Music and song are so often close to the heart of a participant's emotional, emotional engagement in worship and express deeply felt devotions. In Reimagining Worship, which is edited by Delang Lloyd, Stratford and Tarrant, music is presented not only as a biblical but a source of biblical input to our worship. Indeed, music is present from Genesis to Revelation and is used throughout to celebrate the key moments, the creation, Exodus, the birth of Christ, the resurrection and heavenly worship. And I've put the references there for you to look at. Music also enables us as God's people to fulfill the biblical injunction to sing a new song unto the Lord, allowing Christ's words to dwell in us richly as we sing the psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to God and to one another. The Church of England's common worship presents a wonderful variety of psalms and canticles, and there is now much space for hymns, songs, motets and anthems. Now more than ever, the full riches of the differing musical traditions are available for planning our worship. Notwithstanding, music can be an arena for the most immense conflict. Congregations will often define themselves by the songs they sing or don't sing, just as they do by making conscious choices about the extent and the embrace of symbolism and gesture within their worship. Mark Erie, in his book, Liturgical Worship 2018, offers a framework for outlining three differing descriptors of worship. The third level specifically talks 
of focusing our attention to God in prayer, praise through the use of the Bible. And Erie endorses the use of sung music, which absolutely quotes biblical material. Additionally, he developed a model of interpretation of how the New Testament can give us pointers on how the first Christians began to develop worship. And he breaks these down into the following dimensions. So I've put them up there for you. The first of which is human to human dimension. That's fellowship supporting the poor statements, common belief, uh, and sharing the peace. The second he talks about is a God to human dimension. And finally, the one that's most significant and important for us to look at is human to God dimension. That's in praising God, the singing of hymns and music and praying. Now, worship is always a divine activity, but it is important for us to understand that it's never less than a human one. And though we cannot control the spirit, we can shape our human behaviour whilst making room for the spirit's work and avoid hindering God's action. Helen Bent in Evaluating Worship 2016 says that worship is so much more than simply what is said. We inhabit it and experience what is done and how it is done. It is a corporate activity of the whole people of God, bringing the church together and making it visible. When the beauty of the liturgy is matched with appropriate music, Worship can soar, transporting the soul and acting as a window through which we glimpse the divine, maybe for the first time. So worship can be reviewed as a set of purposes, and it's easy to see how much music can cont contribute to these areas. The purposes I've identified at worship as an intimate encounter, that it is personal with God's presence felt. Worship as edification, that is feeding our minds and understanding to build our faith. Worship as duty and service, that it's a discipline that we have to do whether we feel like it or not. And worship as an ongoing offering, part of a continuous stream of worship around the world and in heaven for God's pleasure. So concerning worship as edification, let us consider Corinthians 14, 26. Then what should it be like, brothers? When you come together, each of you brings a psalm or some instruction or a revelation or speaks in tongue or gives an interpretation. Let all these things be done in a way that will build up the community. So I consider that the Apostle Paul here is speaking more of a mutual upbuilding than of worship. And it's this upbuilding which he terms edification. Now, edification can mean a great deal of things today. But we should consider the word in its original meaning, and that is to instruct and improve, especially in moral and religious knowledge. In his cerebral text, Paul, Paulus, Borkman suggests that Paul is not referencing edification as an individual subjective experience, but that Paul is only interested in the edification of the church. So 1 Corinthians 14, 3 to 5, 12, 17 and verse 26. Borncam asserts that Paul suggests that each church member has a duty to edify the rest. And he endorses this outside of Corinthians and in 1 Theolotians, again in Corinthians, and but also in Romans 14, verse 19, and Romans 15, verse 2, following a standard as set down by Christ himself. That is, when we exhort one another and hold one another accountable, we are prompted to engage in activities that promote godliness. Music may assist us in this edification of the whole church. So thoughts on how we can use music to aid our worship. Well, we can use it to shine a spotlight on significant liturgical moments. And when speech is used alone, it is sometimes difficult to lift important parts of the worship above other parts of the service. 
in this situation, music can be beneficial. Everything can sound the same all the time when spoken. And singing is acknowledged to be an elevated form of speech. So moments in worship that are more important than others can be highlighted with music. And music often distinguishes and clarifies the shape of our worship. Music can set the mood. Music can echo and reinforce other parts of the service. The second point is that it can enable the assembly to unite as one and create an identity. So using rhythm, measuring and unifying time. Now, John Bell, in his book, The Singing Thing, suggests that people cannot speak together in time, often reading and speaking at different speeds. Music in this situation could keep a large group together, providing the regularity of beat and regularity of pulse. Furthermore, Bell suggests that if we sing and select music in order to express our collective identity, music creates a unanimity unanim, unanim, of the co-celebrants and participation. And the parameters involved in musical acoustics can sometimes create better audibility to the assembly than words. And music and singing require an extra physical effort. In the words of the psalmist, Psalm 65, all my bones shall cry out, Lord, who is like thee? The third point there, to respond to God through music. We have a need to give something back to God. If we look back, or just remind you, here is third human to God dimension. So as a cathedral musician and a reflective practitioner, this area is of great interest to me. And I'm often challenged about encouraging active participation within worship. Now, cathedrals are blessed with great musical resources. And the traditional arguments that revolve around offering God the very best, the highest pinnacle of human achievement, music is part of that human endeavour. It is right and proper that highly trained musicians and singers should have the room to make music on behalf of the assembly. However, the rebel in me also agrees that on Easter Sunday, should it not be everyone's right to lift their voices in celebration of glory to God in the highest? Academic defence of the cathedral tradition is offered by Thomas R. Whelan in Day and Gordon Taylor's The Study of Liturgy and Worship. He says that a balance must be achieved between the desire for musical excellence and the possibilities available to an actual assembly whose musical worship and praise is rooted in their cultural and human reality. Listening to music does not have to be a passive activity, but can be a form of co-performing, allowing the hearer to be carried into a deep consideration of the mystery through the splendour of text or sound, which is beautifully rendered. Therefore, the solo work of choir singers and instrumentalists is never a performance, and musical talent is always at the service of God through the assembly. It is therefore nothing more or nothing less than a ministry within itself. Music can create an atmosphere, it can heighten drama, and it can be transformative. Music expresses in ways that words cannot. And there is much written in terms of musical aesthetics with regards to whether music contains emotion. Look at Cook's monumental work in 1959, The Language of Music or whether it simply acts as a conduit for the transference of emotion, Susanna Langer, 1941. Music also needs to surprise and engage us. And there's some limited study has been done in this area. For example, if we think of uh, Raw, Ralph Vaughan Williams, All People in Earth Do Dwell, in verse five, where the, 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 the congregation, the choir sing to Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Here, Vaughan Williams substitutes an E major chord 
within the key of G major. And by doing that, what he's do creating is a, a is a pure tug at our soul to move us. That B minor second inversion chord in Wilcox, O oh, Come All You Faithful, on Word of the Father is the same thing, a manipulation of musical technique to shape our emotional response. Music will mean something different to all of us as we're all emotional beings. However, in our context, the words of former Archbishop of York, the most Reverend Dr. Centimoon, are illuminating of how music can be transformative. And I put those words up there for you. I'm not going to read them. Uh, you can just read them uh, while I'm talking. So as humans, we need to express emotions of praise, thanksgiving, joy, shock and sorrow. We can use the elements of music and sound as they are an integral part of God's creation. We have permission to use that as part of his creation. We can use music to inspire and support our church community. So one function of music, or sorry, one function of worship is to sustain, inspire and nourish those leading and taking part in the worship as well as the participants. Music can unite and strengthen a group in their beliefs and in their processes. And people are able to dip into a musical resource when support is needed. There are many rigorously researched publications uh, demonstrating the medical revelations in terms of participating in, playing, singing, and even just experiencing music in terms of our physical, mental, and more importantly, our spiritual health. We can use music to access the past. Music, like smells, can be highly evocative. Music has the power to transport us back to a single moment. And we should ask ourselves, is the music and the songs of the future that will be evocative to God, are we using them now? What we sing and we perform hears, shapes and informs what we believe. Again, John Bell in The Singing Thing endorses this by saying that in our song, we do not simply versify what is written about the bible we also state what we hold to be true about life and about god and when the church sings it is determinative of the faith which the singers hold music can be mission so my colleague john leach 2011 suggests that music can play a vital part in mission attracting playing a role in proclamation and energizing those sent out in the power of the spirit to love and serve the Lord. This includes instrumental music, as well as thrilling organ voluntaries to improvisations of a jazz band. Baton's wonderful composition, And I Saw a New Heaven. It's our imaginations that need feeding with the possibilities of a new creation that is yet to be eschatologically, we need to be given that glimpse of heaven. Music is a key expression that can lift us to heaven. Music can transcend and bring us closer to the mystery and wonder of what is being played out. What in teaching we used to call awe and wonder. It could be that it is music that speaks to our soul and opens up the power of grace in the way that words fail to do. In a culture where noise is so prevalent, times of silence in worship may be welcome moments of respite to those which pay attention to nothing but the present moment. Silence in that way is just as important as music. Silence is the oral equivalent to closing our eyes in order to free oneself from distraction. Silence can help us pay attention, pause and reflect Silence has the advantage of allowing us to make space for differing opinions and differing views. Silence can be used with 
when words will simply just not do. For example, we're all aware of that collective feel of the two minute silence on Remembrance Day, or when there was a world disaster like 9-11, people stood in shock, but also they stood in silence. Cautiously, it's worth remembering that silence can also be difficult for some people. However, it can be refreshing at the same time. And as worship leaders, we need to ensure that these silences don't become truncated, allowing the assembly time to settle into a quiet. It is interesting to note that when God spoke, he only spoke when all of the noise ceased. 1 Kings 19 verse 12. We may find silence unnerving, but increasingly there is a need for quiet space in our busy world. Worship and prayer belong as much to silence as they do to song. Fundamentally, the idea of Christian worship is not primarily about what we do when we gather as the church, though that is important, but it needs to be about how we live when we engage with the world day by day, hour by hour. Our worship needs to be practically connected. And Helen Bent in 2017 sums up her practical position. She says, despite the ideas of music and differing traditions, we always need to discover the authentic expression of worship for our own context. We want to value and infirm gifts, but we also need to gently challenge the prima donnas, the worship leaders with inflated egos, professionalism, elitism, or anything else that may move the focus away from God onto the musicians or onto the quality of the performance. So turning to the mystery of the Eucharist, we must first consider liturgy. Day and Gordon Taylor in 2013 defined liturgy as the worship offered to God by the church itself. Indeed, the English word liturgy from the Greek literally means work of the people. But the word liturgy has come to denote the structured body of text and ritual by which the church, as a corporate body, offers worship to God. Stephen Burns elaborates further in highlighting a strong bond between liturgy and worship. That worship is the more fundamental reality, the response of the whole person towards God in praise, adoration and thanksgiving. And that liturgy is the structured set of words and movements that enables worship to happen. A very new publication by Michael Dodaro, a controversial book called Music War in Church, presents the opinion that the historical evolution of the church's liturgy and development, development of the mass is in itself an example of a ceremonial music drama. He argues that the mass contains nearly all the ingredients of a music drama, with members of the clergy serving as solo performers, the congregation becoming the responsorial chorus, and that these varying rituals are choreographed, physical movement, the chanting, and the text are all in place to create a sense of drama. Conversely, the priest musician Joseph Jelinow to, uh, 1920, 2008, wrote that if music serves not just as an ornament to worship, but as an actor at the very heart of the salvific sal and worshipful event that transpires when believers assemble to actively act, then it can be legitimately expected that the contours of a liturgical theology will emerge. Stephen Burns in 2018 in his book Liturgy endorses that liturgy is not something done by a presiding minister before an observing congregation, but that liturgy literally is the people's work. Glancing through the lens of history, it is clear to see the, the official liturgy we use, although given to us from the Roman Catholic Church, has been reacted upon to greater or lesser degrees during the European Reformation and it certainly continues to reflect today. Furthermore, that the Church of England, uh, to many, liturgy has come to mean the service of Holy Communion, and it includes assumptions about the basic shape and outline of the service, as well as its particular context and content. 
Erie in 2018 suggests that there is a value in recognizing liturgical music, uh, liturgical worship, as a means of recognizing that these things are simply too important and too formative to be allowed to happen by accident, that we must develop a liturgy and write it down to preserve. Stephen Burns in 2018 offers strong support from the liturgist Don Salias, according and adding that Salias distinguishes in the participation, the in the phenomena, the singing, the reading, the praying, the doing the right from the participation, the right as the church. That is participating as a solidarity, as a belonging to one another, sharing the mystery of God. And that the role of liturgy is really in the right as the church. In considering Eucharistic theology, we must remain aware that there is a great mystery that means something very different to each of us. And liturgy can offer some signposting of this experience and can be converted into an opportunity to enhance our corporate worship. <clears throat> As the preface to Common Worship states, the journey through liturgy has a clear structure with signposts for those less familiar with the way. Jalinu comments specifically on the Eucharist, saying that if music is integral to the liturgical action of the assembly and its ministers, then it cannot but facilitate the sacramental action of worship. Music which is appropriately chosen can serve to carry the assembly into the heart of the Paschal mystery itself being celebrated, thus making it disposed to the self-implication that the true worship requires. So where is music best used in the Eucharist? Music as the assembly <coughs> is gathering needs to place people into the mindset for authentic worship. So in more solemn seasons of Advent and Lent, for example, we might advocate silence, though this will depend on the style of the church. As for some of that time before the Eucharist may also be a time for the family to greet each other, in which case silence is not appropriate. I recall again the request from the congregation to sing a Gloria and Excelsis on Easter day. And in fact, I often marry a choral liturgy with a setting of glory to God, sung to the tune of Handel's Thine Be the Glory, simply for that reason. The gradual, or the rise to the gospel, incorporating the use of psalms. Now, the book of Psalms provides one of the most complete lexicons of human emotion in the scriptures, as well as being a mirror reflecting universal human experience. In Colossians 3, verse 16, Paul tells us, Milking, so. Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to God. We have forgotten the psalms. So careful use of the psalms at specific times can reflect your community's context. Yes, Anglican chant has a richness but is not the only form of chant. Responsorial psalms are useful and there is a growing community using plain song. Now we associate plain song with the monks and monasteries, but it was actually the Victorians who reintroduced it as an aid for full participation in congregational song. Both the Iona and Northumbrian community offer simple short pieces which are based and often quote the psalms. Pre-choirs, we were used to metrical versions of the psalms, and these are also still widely available. There are a number of contemporary songwriters that have produced versions of the psalms in the contemporary idiom too, and I'm thinking of Stuart Townsend and Keith and Kirsten Getty. The psalms can be used to reinforce local issues and community struggles and celebrations, enabling worship from the heart and resonating with our local community. And a psalm at the gradual may offer a response to the readings which come later on. 
A diverse repertoire of music should aim to mirror the diversity of the Psalms. The gospel. So here music should be used to mark out, not just a hymn. You can go wider. The awesome power of recorded orchestral brass could be used, not just an obvious fanfare, perhaps a big mo movement of Beethoven or even Mahler. If you have an organist, there is this is the moment to directly engage with them and with the gospel. Give them the reading a week in advance. Let them be creative. Perhaps let them even use technology to help mark out the gospel. Intercessions. We all know the power and importance of prayer and space used in the liturgy. However, rather than simply reading a said response, why not sing one? So again, I refer to the biological, here I refer to the biological connection between singing and crying. That we use this when we when we cry, we use the same biological mechanism as we use when we sing. I often use a, a beautiful song, it's here, um, not every week, I, I drop it in and out, by Anne Quigley, There's a Longing in Our Hearts. And <clears throat> it's cantor led, but the bit that what you can see on the screen in front of you at this moment is sung by the entire congregation. Very easy to pick up. There's a longing in our hearts, O oh Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us. There is a longing in our hearts for love we only find in you, our God, the cantor, for justice, for freedom, for mercy in our prayer, in sorrow, in grief. Be near our prayer, O oh God, congregation. There's a longing in our hearts, and so on. And you can actually use that as an alternative to just your said intercessions. It's available in the new ancient and modern uh, hymn book, songs. I think it's called Hymns and Songs for Refreshing Worship. And it can be done by the whole choir congregation by call and response. Again, as I said, I wouldn't use it every single week, but once in a while, it challenges the assemblies and engages them in a different way. There are lots of these resources. Iona and Northumbrian community can be used as a structure, allowing the members of the assembly to insert their own intercessions. We should encourage the spontaneous as well as the carefully crafted. Above all, our intercessions, I believe, should be honest, they require research and not simple repetition of a banal set of words. They should be connected to our community and beyond, to the harshness of the world and ending with an eschatological bias of our place in the world with the joining of the communion of saints. I should also like to draw attention to the Sanctus and Benedictus. Now, for me, this is a key marker between sections of the Eucharistic liturgy. It is in itself a juxtaposition of two scriptal pericodes. The vision of Isaiah, Isaiah 6 verse 3, and the song of the crowd as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Moreover, it's notable that that moment, the prayer is basically Trinitarian. First of all, praising the first person, focusing on Jesus before finally inviting the spirit. It is also a moment when we join with the whole company of heaven. And I refer again to that eschatological need to sing at that moment. There's a connection with the communion of saints. If you are blessed with a choir of musicians, involve them in the conversation. It may be that at that moment, it's not always appropriate for your choir to sing a glorious Sanctus and Benedictus. What other music could be sung, played or even improvised? For example, teaching the congregation to hold a simple, slow-moving, open fifth cause or garnum on the word praise or hosanna, whilst an instrumentalist improvises over the top of the sequence. So the Eucharist itself, that moment, whether it be transubstantial, transignification, memorial or receptionism, how is this best approach? Performed music as well as recorded music can be used here. But I refer back to St. Augustine's warning, the plainer, the better. 
Choirs will often choose this moment to sing the most complicated choral works. But this is a moment perhaps to reinforce the Eucharistic theology with a simple unaccompanied hymn or a gentle spiritual song. Don't be afraid of silence, particularly in the penitential periods. Use well, it can be very powerful. After all, once the moment has passed, there is an easy transition to great songs of praise and thanksgiving. But you may say, what if I'm not musical? What if I have no choir? What if I have no organist? Well, your community has a rich wealth of talent. There will be local musicians in the congregations and the schools. Though it has its place, don't be tempted to default to said worship. Music can be led from a solo violin or a solo flute and be just as authentic and just as transformative to your worship. You are the resource yourself. Sing and embrace the challenge yourselves. There's plenty of organisations there to help you. The RSCM provides music parts for a range of inst instrumental musicians. And uh, Transforming Worship, which used to be known as Praxis, the think tank of the Church of England Liturgical Commission, um, they will have a local network of which musicians are a vital and integral part. Look to the future, but draw from the past. So some questions we should consider. Our ideas about worship have changed and evolved. We should take a lead from our present liturgical position. Our choice should be appropriate to the forms of worship we use today, but drawing from the past. When choosing music, look at the people who will be using it. Consider your own personal taste and choosing for others. Think about the differences of taste we all have in musical styles. How far do we let these tastes influence our choices and music for worship? Should we leave these tastes at home or at least in the car's CD player? Should we be able to use the musical styles we like in our worship? Where there is no opportunity for choice of worship style, what happens? Does your church have separate services to cater for those with different musical tastes? And is there a dominant group or a person in charge of the choice of music? So as we emerge into an enlightened world, both as a group and both as individuals, I hope that this brief presentation has provoked you into some kind of action, discussion, maybe a source of contemplation, meditation, even silence or spirit-filled prayer. Our worship, liturgy and Eucharist are integral to the communities in which we operate. We emerge refreshed, challenged and inquisitive for a greater reimagined music to enhance our worship, all for the greater glory of God. And a final return to St Augustine and his confessions. He says, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. So we thank God for the gift of music and all that it does and gives us. And much more for the gift of himself who meets our every need and fills our daily lives with his music. There's a brief bibliography um, of some of the works that I've talked about there and if anybody has any comments or questions, there's my email address at the cathedral. You're welcome to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for um, the opportunity to hear your paper and um, for those uh, lovely thoughts. Um, I wonder if we could open up um, the uh, the floor for any questions um, at this stage. Does anyone have any questions? Just uh, feel free to uh, jump out. Well, if if no one is going to to start with one, I, I have one. Uh, in fact, I have two for you, but I might um, I might start with one. Um, you you use the term co-performing, and I think that's a really yeah. interesting. That's a really interesting one. Because um, in in various ways uh, you've shown us that when we listen 
and when we engage with music that other people are producing, or or indeed, um, uh, you mentioned at various points uh, the use of recorded music, um, which is can, can be a can be an interesting uh, conversation to have with with clergy musicians, um, both with listening to live music and and to recorded music. There's, there's a sense you're pointing to a sense in which um, the individual worshipper enters into that music and makes it their own and and as i understand it in in some sense there's a there's a co-performance i wonder if you could say a little bit more about that yeah i mean i'm particularly this is starting to resonate um with with uh, with some of the clergy that uh, I've, I've spoken to before there seems to be particularly post-covid there's a kind of a new phenomena um, that when they're invited out to do joint services, kind of churches together services in the town, um, congregations that are gathering, in a sense, don't really want the participation element now in a post-COVID world. What they're quite happy to do is to kind of almost, what to literally to watch other people doing it. So uh, YouTube clips are popular. All this technology that we embraced in the COVID has become so fixed into our liturgy that congregations are almost saying, well, actually, we don't we don't really want to do it, but we're participating it by watching and engaging with a with a production of it. And in a sense, that that I think is beginning to unpack this whole co-performing thing. That actually the congregation are co-performing by watching and by uh they are they're engaging because they're watching and uh it's that process and i think there's 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 research that needs to be done in that element it's very early stages but it's certainly a very new thing and i guess that that whole kind of co-performance thing could be applied to that it, it's it's almost antithetical to uh the way that um Roman Catholic documents of the 1960s and 70s have framed active participation. I think, uh, Peter, you and I have talked a little bit about this uh, on another occasion, I think. Yeah. But um, the, the, the sense that you have to be making a noise yeah. in order to be participating um, seems seems very well entrenched, uh, not yeah, only yeah. across the Catholic Church, but in the Church of England, in, in other churches with, with ordered worship and, and a, a respect for the role of music. And I think education has an input here because, I mean, certainly I, I mentioned awe and wonder, but there was also a principle when I was teaching a long time about, about um, um, uh, now what was it called? It was called, um, oh, I've, I've forgotten. <laughs> it was, it was be, being active by listening, active listening, I think we called it in those days. There was very much a philosophy behind that. And it, that there was a participation by actively listening. And I think the same could be applied to our congregations now when I mean, particularly in the cathedral context, because I'm we are constantly challenged you know, about choirs. We are blessed with resources, you know, uh, it, where even song can become like a, an opera, like a concert, you know, essentially. But there are uh, there are there is an element of active listening which is happening um and and this is happening a bigger wider there's there's a lot of research and a lot of um media spin around cathedrals are the fastest growing communities the fast blah 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 what what is kind of happening there i think is that we're not talking about the actual spiritual dimensions of that at the moment what we're talking about is kind of almost the aesthetic perception that i think we're seeing lots of people approaching the cathedrals and the choirs and the music for a sense of aesthetic beauty in much the way in, in a similar uh similar side the coin is is the same sort of fervor and pleasure people get from engaging in very charismatic worship it's i was about I'm not to say sure it's a spiritual thing it's more of an aesthetic thing but there's a there's a sense in which um lots of music um in charismatic worship or or performed by worship bands um some of it is designed uh or 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 fashioned to be uh, easily singable by lots of people it's got a limited range and and it's repetitive 
Um, but some of it is actually really difficult for yeah, absolutely uh, to sing even even the refrains because of absolutely. Huge, huge intervals, um, uh, interesting leaps, um, and, and 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 high expectations of the human voice. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I, I would reckon that th that might also be a, a location, not just the the cathedral even song where yeah yeah, yeah. listening or whatever we're going to call it is 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 in play. Are, are there other questions from Pete from the floor or reflections on what we've been hearing? Um, Matthew, can I can I ask a question? Please do. Thanks. So, um, Peter, thank you very much for this uh, really interesting uh, uh, talk and lots of it's almost it doesn't quite draw on from from what you've been discussing just now. But I'm interested that idea of co-performance is very suggestive. And one of your um, early slides um, uh, drew attention to to lots of factors of music and worship. Um, which which rang a few bells for me as someone who is a, a director of music in a in a in a church with with excellent musical resources, but also has um, uh, a background and a career in making music in theatrical spaces. Um, hmm. So the instances in which music heightens drama, um, yeah. shines a spotlight on on essential moments. I mean, that sounds to me like. The word missing there is narrative. Possibly focus leading is a technical term I would use for that in terms of the use of composition in 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 the theatrical space, creating a unified identity and evoking atmosphere. That is absolutely the function of of music in a in a theatrical um, context. And I wondered. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions really on that. Really, um, the whether it is a an aspect of. Um, and I realized that there's a heresy inherent in this question, <laughs> but the extent to which you considered or or um, the, the the way music operates in a theatrical context as a paradigm for the operation of theater in, in ritual, particularly in modern ritual and religious context. Um, of course, choral music, the way we use it, has its roots absolutely uh, in um in the theatrical realm, which in its uh, and ancient uh, theatrical choral performance has it itself um, its own roots in in ritual. Um, these things are cognate and uh, cyclical, um, but very much related to each other. And I wondered if that's an aspect of this you'd considered. Um, and while we're there, I apologise because I'm asking nine questions at the same time, but they're all related, as you'll see. I, I mentioned in your your analysis of the word liturgy, which, um, and forgive me for being a classicist, in room, but I I understand that to mean work for people, yeah, and, as opposed to necessarily work of people. Work of the people. That yeah. feels an important distinction. Um, it correlates liturgia as in an Athenian context, at least to, um a form of voluntary tax paid by the wealthiest, which funds public goods, n not least of which, of course, is the formation of choruses which perform or co-perform on behalf of the, of their um, citizen audiences. So it feels to me these things are, are all operating in the same sense. Um, it's a heresy, of course, if we think about um, it as a, as a, as a professionalised uh, performance or one which is deliberately there to, to stop us um, to, to disengage us on a spiritual level, but um, it feels fruitful for this, um, the continuation of this research and this discussion. Yeah, so I'll, I'll come up, the first thing, I'll just mention the, the liturgy definition again, hotly contested in the literature. There's certainly the group, that the very classicist stream that you were talking about, uh, work for the people against the work of the people. So that's quite an area which needs sort of unpicking and there's there's a lot of reference to that. Um, but I'm very interested in the kind of theatrical element because this is a very much a new, very new area of research. Even though Jelinu was was talking a little bit about this, he was hinting about this in the in the quotes that I gave you about um that the mu the music supports the uh, evolving drama. He was talking about that. But the the thing I would refer to is this this book which I mentioned, which I've only just got. It's published in two thousand and twenty three. This music in war, uh, music music war in the church. And the the I'll just see if I can find the reference. This guy is actually written as a novel. It's a fictional novel, but it's kind of you know tells a story. And it, he references uh, some new research called A Producer's Guide, Sacred Music Drama, A Producer's Guide. 
by Gerbrandt. Uh, and there's, I mean, there's a whole chapter on unpacking this relationship between music being a theat theatrical musical versus the play out of the liturgy. It's a really kind of interesting emerging field. So I would say watch this space on that because I think people will start to jump on that wagon. I don't think it's been explored in any great detail before. Uh, would you share the details of that in the, in the chat? Yes. Please. Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Other um, questions or comments or thoughts following on from any of that conversation? In another part of your uh, talk, Peter, you, you you talked about uh, the the structure of Holy Communion, uh, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, in the uh, mid twentieth century uh, Catholic document Musicam Sacram, um, there there are three um, three layers of hierarchy of um, uh, musical genres that that might be used, and and actually um, th they say. You don't you don't absolutely have to have any of this but if you if you want levels two and three you definitely have to have level one level one is actually the sung dialogues between uh, if I, if I'm not if I'm not wrong it's the sung dialogues between the priest celebrant and the people um uh, yeah and and all the other the other sort of dialogues which are which, which are common um to both the ministers as it were and 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 the assembly um and, yeah. and everything sort of follows on from that again i think this this is kind of endorsed in this dadara i put that information in the chat in the in the book he's where he's, he starts to talk about the priests almost playing solo roles and the congregation almost playing like a responsorial role within the context of a, a theatrical musical production it is really interesting and i think that echoes a lot of that Catholic theology and a lot of that original um, stuff that was out there, you know, which which the Church of England or a portion of the Church of England have turned their back on and are now reconsidering in a different light, which is re really interesting. I think that to to some extent it's, it's difficult to get away from... Um... From the the consensus view on 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 some of these mid century documents, because because that they have such a pervasive effect in 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 wider culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and the Church of England, because uh, because it's always embraced a wide range of of musical styles and and preferences, hasn't ha hasn't made its own pronouncements in various ways. No, and of course we have a very, I mean, the, the, we, we have a very historical position in the Church of England. We learn liturgy by doing it, you know, uh, which is quite different from uh, the Roman context where uh, the, the importance and significance and job of, of liturgy is, is well written, well documented, you know. Any um any further thoughts from the floor as we um start to wrap up this week's session, the seminar? This is the final time of asking. Um well thank you very, very much, Dr. Peter Lippmann, for, for being with us today and for um for such a stimulating paper and um and and raising such interesting questions which have both uh, a scholarly and, and a practical um uh set of implications it's really good to to be able to reflect on these things um and uh we hope that very much that um you'll be able to come and come and be with us uh in, in yeah i'd love to that'd uh, be fantastic and um and and uh and be involved in um some more activities the institute um next week's paper uh the 27th of february uh is a continuation of uh canon dr victoria johnson's first paper um in this series which was last term on worship and music and mission towards a liturgical missiology session two so it's, it'd be great to welcome victoria back um victoria who's uh recently been uh, announced as the new dean of st john's college cambridge mm -hmm. their 
I think at Easter from York Minster, where she's currently presenter. So it'd be great to welcome her back to seminar next week. Uh, meanwhile, uh, if you're interested in learning more about the programmes available at the Institute of Sacred Music, Oxford, you need only to visit our website, ismo.ssho.org.uk. Uh, just look up the Institute of Sacred Music, Oxford. It's a wonderful um, uh, set of qualifications and courses that you can follow, of which this seminar is one. Uh, it's been very good to be with you uh, today, and we wish you a very pleasant evening or day or morning, wherever you may be. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>